Thank you all for being here. On behalf of the Alliance for Health and Environment and as the state representative who represents this district, which is deeply affected by this environmental injustice that you see behind me, I want to welcome you to Revere. I want to also welcome you to the shadow of Wheeler Brader Saugus. Um, we've called this press conference today because in a couple of weeks, the Department of Environmental Protection will be making a decision on whether or not they should allow expansion of this ash landfill right there, whether or not they should allow it to be ripped open and have another 500,000 tons of toxic ash put in there. It's our hope today to call upon Governor Baker and Commissioner Suberg and to deny Will Abrader's request to expand. It's been gone on for too long. It's a 40-year-old plant that was supposed to shut down in 1996, yet it continues. This, the madness needs to stop, and we're hoping that finally the Department of Environmental Protection will do their job and protect our community from further expansion. If you look, this entire area, January 4th, was underwater. We, we couldn't get... Um, cars by here. The roads were closed on both sides. They were closed from uh, 107 that way to Route 1A here. It was closed for the entire day from Revere to Lynn. These, all these decks that you see were all destroyed. And that is right there where they're going to put an additional 500,000 tons of ash. It's unconscionable. But um, at this point, I'm going to call upon some of the members of the Alliance who um, are comprised of major environmental distinguished groups and I have the honor to first introduce Kirsty Pesci from Conservation Law Foundation. Thank you. Thank you Representative Vincent. My name is Kirsty Pesci. I'm at the Conservation Law Foundation and I just work on solid waste issues. So I look at incinerators and landfills all day throughout New England and try and, and, try and encourage communities to adopt zero waste programs so that we don't have to be doing this any longer. We have ways, we have other options. After reviewing many landfills, many, many different um, plans, many different groundwater monitoring programs, I feel that this landfill is the most dangerous landfill in Massachusetts. And I feel that way because, it, first of all, it, it, they started dumping municipal solid waste here in the 1950s. There is no liner under this landfill. And as you can see, this is all marshland surrounded by rivers. It is resting in water. Then in the mid-70s, after Wheel of Brader Saugus opened its incinerator, they began dumping incinerator ash, over 100,000 tons a year here on top of that. Again, no liner system. As Representative Vincent said, it was supposed to close in 1996 because it didn't have the protective systems required at that time by the law, by the federal law. Yet it still continues to be open. When we looked for groundwater monitoring data to find out, okay, what exactly is leaving this system? If there's no liner system at all, what is being emitted? What contaminants are being released into these rivers? We found that there are no groundwater monitoring wells around this facility. So in Massachusetts, this is the only municipal solid waste or ash landfill that I'm aware of, and I've looked at them all, that doesn't have groundwater monitoring, that's accepting waste into unlined cells and is in an area of critical environmental concern in marshland. You couldn't build a deck on this property and yet they want to rip up 39 acres and put 500,000 tons of ash here. It's unconscionable. This expansion should be stopped and I hope that the governor and Mass DEP hear us today and don't grant the permit to expand this landfill. Thank you very much. Okay, and we'll next call on Joan LeBlanc, who's been a crusader for this um, environmental injustice almost her entire life. She's from the Saugus River Watershed Council. Joan LeBlanc. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm the director of the Saugus River Watershed Council. We're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is protecting and restoring the natural resources of the Saugus River Watershed. 
Looking out here, this is the Pines River, a major tributary to the Saugus. This whole site is part of the Rumney Marshes area of critical environmental concern. I'm very disappointed that we have to be here today, to be perfectly honest with you. We shouldn't be here discussing a possible expansion at this site, for many reasons. And I'm going to call your attention to the context of something that's been in the news very frequently lately, and that's climate change and sea level rise. Representative Vincent alluded earlier to a major storm that was called a new name, Bombo Genesis, something I'd never heard of. I'm still not quite sure what it means. But I know what it meant to the neighborhoods. It meant people were underwater. All of the neighborhoods surrounding this facility were completely underwater. And that was not even with a major storm surge. We are right now working with many communities in the watershed to put proactive measures in place that will protect people and the environment from damages related to storm surge and climate change and sea level rise. Somehow here, what's happening is happening completely out of that context. Or just Monday, we heard from a group of top scientists reporting through the National Academy of Sciences. They reported that, and this is not a political report, this is not a projection, it's not a model. They looked at satellite data. So they used actual information from satellite imagery to look at sea level rise from 1993 coming forward. The result of that analysis is that by the end of the century, we're going to see up to two feet of sea level rise in this region by the end of the century. Another key finding in their study was that the acceleration, the pace that sea level rise is increasing is actually faster than we thought. So the difficult thing that we have, the difficult situation we're in, is every time we get new research, new studies, new data, the news is unfortunately worse. What we know and what we thought in terms of what to expect in this region as far as sea level rise and storm surge is only getting worse. And that's unfortunate news. Now, with that context in mind, there is no scenario, there is no level of engineering or planning that could mean that it would make sense to rip open 39 acres of capped landfill that's currently covered with bird habitat in order to reactivate it in this type of a site. To make matters worse, the part of the landfill that they're talking about ripping up is the part that's closest to the water. So if you look here across the Pines River and you see what looks like a grassy knoll, if you're driving by, you might say, oh, you know, this is lovely. We see a grassy knoll here. But for those of us who know what's in this unlined landfill, we know that this is a potential environmental disaster in the future. And we know that closing and capping isn't even enough. We need to close and cap this landfill today, but we also need to take a close look at what can be done to protect people in the future. If 10, 20 years down the road we have the type of bombogenesis storm that we had and it's combined with the highest tide level of the season and a storm surge, we could see major damage everywhere along the coast. We could see a breach in this landfill. Now you heard a little bit about the Rumney Marshes area of critical environmental concern. This is a salt marsh. This is in the middle of the estuary. The estuary provides the foundation for the food web of this entire ecosystem. If this is contaminated, then you can assume that every fish, bird, and mammal feeding in this region would also be contaminated. I also don't know of any cleanup methods that could address ash that is washed throughout a system like this. I am not aware of a cleanup that would cover that. But what I am aware of is that we can make decisions today, decisions that will help minimize the problem. One of those decisions is a decision that the governor's office and the Department of Environmental Protection is currently facing. And that decision is whether or not to allow an expansion here. We say no. We say it's a no-brainer. This needs to be capped and closed and contained to protect people and to protect wildlife. I'm going to wait for that train to go by. So today I want to make an announcement on behalf of the Alliance for Health and Environment. In addition to being here to simply say we're concerned and we'd like to see this permit denied, we also would like to call on state officials and decision makers to launch a new decision-making approach. 
a policy and planning approach which looks across the entire state and identifies sites like this, because this is just one sample. There are landfills and other sites of concern located all across the coast in Massachusetts. We need a proactive planning and permitting effort that identifies those sites and that takes action to protect people in the future. If this decision was being made in that context, we wouldn't be here today. It would have been buttoned up 20 years ago and we would be working on how to mitigate this site. That is the direction we believe that we should go in and we would very much welcome the opportunity to work with state officials on that kind of proactive approach that uses this as a sample for why we need this regional approach because this is not the only site of concern. But one thing that we would guess is that the ash landfills, the landfills and the other sites that are industrial in nature and utilize chemicals along the coast and pose risks most of them are located in communities of environmental justice and that is of equal concern and these are neighborhoods where no people don't have the resources to come in and rebuild their homes over and over they don't have millions of dollars to do that these are their homes they want to live here they have neighborhoods that they've been in for a long time so we all have a responsibility to partner with the people living here and to protect the resources that are here for future generations. And we look forward to working with the governor and with DEP on that approach. Thank you. Okay, another one member of our alliance is um, our wonderful um, Deb Panetta. She's chairwoman of the Saugus Board of Selectmen. Deb, who's a staunch fighter and you, a great partner here. Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for coming. Yes, I'm, my name is Deborah Panetta, and I am the chairperson of the Saugus Board of Selectmen. It's important that you all know that the selectmen have continuously voted a policy saying no more ash emissions in this critically sensitive area. We have an unlined ash landfill, something that would never, ever be allowed today in an area of critical environmental concern. You've heard that this landfill was supposed to be closed in 1996, over 20 years ago, with the grassy seed. We have asked over and over again to Wheelabrator representatives, what is your closure date? We haven't received one. We need a date from Wheelabrator. When are you going to close? Not only has the Saugus Selectmen, top officials say no more ash emissions, our town meeting also voted a similar resolution of no more ash emissions in that critically sensitive area. And it's going on to deaf ears. We hope that the DEP steps up, does the right thing, and say no more expansion. It's counterintuitive to what they're supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be closing that ash landfill, not opening it back up for another 39 acres for it just to close again. It's the wrong thing to do. We're sending the wrong message. So again, we're hoping that the DEP does the right thing because I can tell you that Saugus officials, you'll hear from Revere officials, we want that landfill to be closed. Thank you. Okay, another one of our women who has fought valiantly with us um, is Cindy Loopy from Clean Water Action. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Cindy Lupi. I'm the New England Director for Clean Water Action, and we're very pleased to be here today to stand up for health, to stand up for justice, and to stand up for an end to the assault that this facility is placing in this region. Uh, we are uh, very aware that this is a facility that's been operating for 40 plus years and it's been accepting waste from the surrounding communities, trash from Boston, from Winthrop, where I live, from the entire region. And what happens is that trash is burned and the toxics in it leach into the ash and leach into the area. There isn't enough testing to know 
exactly what's going on in the aquatic environment, but we know it's not good. We know that the toxic chemicals in that ash include some of the most dangerous known to human health, including dioxins, furans, lead, mercury, uh, selenium, arsenic. We know these are some of the best studies chemicals that, uh, that exist. We know the science is strong linking them to incidents, increased incidents of cancer, of learning disabilities and behavioral disorders, of reproductive disorders. So uh, we are very proud to stand here today with Rep. Vincent and all of our allies in the Alliance to call for justice to call for an end to the health assault in this region and really to urge the governor and the DEP to do the right thing and deny the expansion of this facility. Thank you. And with that, we'll have our city councilor, and he also is the ward councilor for this area. He's also been very vocal and very helpful, and he's a good friend to um, Revere. Councillor John Powers. Thank you, Rosalie. Uh, good morning, everyone. This facility never should have been allowed in the first place from day one. We're sitting on a very valuable water resource. And anyone that doesn't believe in global warming should have been down here two weeks ago when I tried to get from Revere Street to the Point of Pines over this highway. It was impassable, not allowed. Just look at the height of that. And they want to go higher. That right now is one and a half times higher than the houses over here on Riverside. Totally wrong. They come around every once in a while with their checkbooks and they go to town hall or city hall and they say, well, here, we want to build a playground. We want to give you money for your recreation programs. We want to help the city. But the irony of the whole thing is the kids that are using those playgrounds right now, the people that are in their recreation programs, whether they're senior citizens or younger, they're going to be affected if this is allowed by the DEP and our governor to, to go forward. I ask right now that the DEP and the governor look at this very closely and the ultimate decision be no. To do otherwise would be inviting shame in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you. And I'd like to recommend, before I announce um, my last speaker, I, I would love if the governor and the commissioner of DEP could come down and actually visit these sites in person and not just to tour the Wheel of Brader, um dog and pony show that they're exposed to um, on a pretty regular basis because we'll show them what is really happening here and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look over here and know that this is wrong. Uh, so, um, but our next speaker is our Revere resident, another champion, L. Baker. L. 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 Been doing a lot of work on this. She actually had a paper on this, um, and she can explain a little bit more. Hi, thanks to all of you for being here today. My name is Elle Baker. I'm a resident in Revere. I actually grew up in East August, just down the street from what was formerly Resco, now Wheel of Brader. And you can see in the background that over the years, uh, this mountain has grown to 50 foot high ash landfill, unbeknownst to many of the people that live in the surrounding community, including myself, up until just a few years ago when I was alerted to an expansion of an ash landfill and then I started to dig into what does that really mean? What is Wheel of Brader and what do they do? So the, yes, they are a waste to energy facility. They do take our trash and they do create energy from that, but there are residual effects. The residual effects is they create ash from burning the trash. That ash, about 10 
approximately 10% of that is that most hazardous part. 90%, the bottom ash, also hazardous, but not to the same degree. So in this case, in this state, and in this country, what we do is we combine the fly ash with the bottom ash into one mixture. It's then put in the landfill, and then the leachate is tested. The ash is not tested in the facility. The ash is not tested in the landfill. The water runoff is what's tested. So we've asked numerous times to find out what does that really mean? And is that leaching out into the waterways, which are obviously right on the shore? Um, and there's a lot of dangerous materials in the ash. Cadmium, lead, arsenic, dioxin, which is one of the main chemicals that cause cancer that is produced. It's a man-made chemical produced, and, and it is a major factor in increasing cancer rates. So we know that these things are in the ash. To what degree and how much of that is leaching into our community, we don't know the answer to that. We have asked through the MEPA process as a community to have a full environmental impact report completed. An overwhelming amount of you, many of you are here today, took the time, wrote your letters, told your stories, voiced your concerns to the DEP, and just want to know the answers. What really is in the ash? And that was denied. A full environmental impact report was not required to move forward with the preliminary approval of expansion. Then we had another community meeting, which we were given the opportunity to again voice our opinions. And we do hope that all of the comments are taken into consideration, that the community does have concerns, that we want to know what's in the ash. We want to know more about how this is being tested. This facility has been here for 40 years. That's when the testing methods were incorporated. We also know that it, caused, it took legislation for Wheel Abrader to actually put scrubbers on the smokestacks, which you can see behind us here. So for years that technology was available, but it took legislation to force Wheel Abrader to actually facilitate it here right in this facility. So when we did that, it's great because it makes the air a little cleaner, but it makes the ash much dirtier because anything that would have been going up in the air is now being captured in the fly ash. So again, since that's happened, has any of the testing methods changed? Thank you all for being here. We appreciate your time. So, so we can open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions? I have a question. Okay. I've been this because I've been involved with this thing for a number of years. They keep talking about, we don't know what's in the water. Well, why can't we find out what's in the water? What's the big deal? That's Why very... can't we find out? Why can't the state find out? They say there's nothing in the water. We say there is. We think there is. Why can't we find out for sure what's in the water? Well, I think they're I've supposed been to. That for four yeah. or five years. Well, they're supposed to be doing groundwater testing, but they're not. Well, somebody's got to do it. The state. And the state's supposed to do it, and they're not. Any? Yes. Um, well, Kirstie, you want to... And it isn't this federal? So, the regulations are federal. The, the waste regulations are separate from the Clean Water and Clean Air Act. Um, here, because the facility existed before the testing, the groundwater testing, for instance, uh, requirements were put in place, they got grandfathered. So instead of having a site assignment that they would have had to get from the Board of um, Health in Saugus, and, and the Board of Health probably would have required all of this kind of testing, Mass DEP issued a consent order in 89 that said, all right, you're not doing what you're required to do now. We're going to let you run till 96, and then we're going to close you. But then they never closed them. So my, my uh, argument would be yes, that this facility is in violation of federal regulations, federal solid waste regulations. However, Mass DEP's position is because they issued that consent order, it's all OK. One more question. Can we then ask that the Environmental Protection Agency to come in and do the testing? 
that is something that I think after we see how this pro how this permit process goes, I think that's the kind of question we're going to have to be asking. That's right, because this because again, every other facility in Massachusetts has groundwater monitoring. Why is this one not? Why does this one not? Every so. other every other facility has a liner, and this one does not. Why is that? We yeah. should ask them that as well. Yeah. Every other. Um, landfill does not sit in the middle of a wetland in an area of cr critical environmental concern. All the others are state-of-the-art, double liner, buffered, not near any um, homes, uh, but not this one. Yeah. And there's a neighborhood, by the way, the Riverside neighborhood was here before the plant. So when I heard someone once say that, you know, why would you build a house there if you saw it? Well, guess what? Those neighbors were there before Wheelabrator built their plant. So and the other thing is we I mean from when I bought my house, I think the airport has increased tenfold. It's flights coming in and out. Like we're not bombarded with bad air from flights already. Yeah. We well sadly well. because we're an environmental justice community and you can see all all you can see, we have the airplanes that are flying Every over. We have thousands of cars that go into Boston and then use our streets. Trains we have the trains that go here, we have the subway, and we have the oil farms. Yeah, so I guess they say so, let's give them a little bit more. Let's give them some ash, you know. Um, and that'll, then we have it all. I mean, it's, it's, it's a disgrace and it's very upsetting because the average person looks at this and says, it can't happen. And guess what? My gut tells me it's going to. Anybody else have a question? And Can um, we not consider an injunction? I mean, has that been looked at by CLF? I mean, is it a possibility that they would then respond because that's I, in place? I think everything's on the table once we see what happens with this permit. My hope is that this permit will not be granted and this facility will close. And uh, if I could add one quick remark, there's also legislation that's pending in the State House right now that would require the examination of environmental justice concerns very formally as a mandate around these kinds of planning and, and facility decisions. And that is exactly what is needed here. We need that leadership from the governor. The legislature should not be having to take steps to require that the governor use common sense and frankly stand up for, for the health of low-income communities of color and other folks who live around this facility. Anybody else? It's going to be 30 years, June 28th, that I stood with Greenpeace over there and shut that place down. 30 years ago. We were looking at it being closed then. Maybe another seven years, I think, again. So we're talking 23 years. I live down the end of Mills Ave, so I'm right dead across from there. You, might, you don't see what happened years ago the fly ash that come out of those smokestacks that ate the paint off my car and landed on the windowsills in my house. It was like a black, greasy stuff. And the stuff that leaches out of that, leaches out of there, that there's no vegetation. People fishing over here, catching fish. This is, this is serious. This is oh, serious. This is people's out. They really, really need to Thank you all exactly. for being here, especially our new people, Kathleen and Bob, and all of you. Um, Bob and Joe over there. So, um, you know, we need to get the word out. We we need your help because we have we 
are not a billion dollar company that spends money um, like water and can um, make influences by doing that. We're just a group of people who care. And without you, we're not going to get anywhere. So I appreciate it.